as promised this one is for you because you asked so i'm going to review the 79 version of salem's lot let's do this <laughs> Salem's Lot stars David Soul, James Mason, Bonnie Bedelia, and is directed by Toby Hooper. What's up, guys? Welcome to a very special catalog review, a review that I wasn't planning on doing, at least right now. I might have done it in the future, but I stated that I would do it if enough of you asked for it, and quite a few of you asked for it in the remake review for Salem's Lot, which that humbled me that was really really kind of you guys and i appreciate that and i know not that it matters but i know that this won't get the views that my new release reviews get that's just you know that's the review game in youtube these days it's the new release market right everybody wants to get that quick opinion on the new movies that are coming out and i do too i understand that so doing catalog reviews though i think can be more fun uh, because you can just kind of dive a little deeper, you know, you don't worry so much about spoilers and a, a movie like this Of course, I'm not gonna worry about spoilers and it's a vampire movie I think the only thing you could spoil is the very end of the movie. That's about it. But uh, right now it is um, Time for Hurricane Milton. Hurricane Milton is literally upon me right now. I live in uh, Orlando, Florida and uh, It's supposed to hit within the next few hours uh, and as with any hurricane, I've went through quite a few of them. You always have downtime. And luckily, I still have power. So I thought, you know what? This would be a good opportunity to go up and turn the lights on and talk about Salem's Lot. And I can think of worse things to do. But I'm hoping and praying that everybody is safe and sound after this thing is over with. Uh, it is a little scary out there right now. But uh, yeah, um, Godspeed to everybody. Seriously. <laughs> So let's jump into Salem's Lot 79. Uh, I will state, and I did state this in the other review, um, somebody sent me the Blu-ray a few years ago, and it's been quite a few years, and I unfortunately have forgotten who sent it to me. So if you sent this to me, please, please, please let me know. Send me a DM. You can post it in the comments, so that way I can properly thank you for sending me the Blu-ray. But I remember throwing the Blu-ray in, um, I think last year. I was just, I was like, I, I need to finally watch this. But I just didn't have the time, really, because I didn't realize that the movie was uh, like a miniseries, that it was three hours long. And when I'm watching a movie, I like to just get really, really immersed in it. You know, phone's off, and I got the time to invest. I'm not looking at the clock. And uh, this is a movie that requires that. And also, this is a movie from the late 70s, and those movies do tend to be a little bit um, more of a slow burn which this one definitely is. It's based on the beloved Stephen King novel. I was just watching It Chapter 1 and Chapter 2 today in my downtime, and uh, that's five hours worth of a uh, movie right there. That's because Stephen King is so great with characters. You know, the guy just loves to get, uh, you know, deep into rich, fun characters. And uh, this movie is no exception. And I like that Toby Hooper took on this project and tried to focus heavily on the characters. Because I think when you do that and you care about the characters, it's just going to make the horror movie that much more effective and dare I say, maybe even scarier. This movie is PG, which shocked me after I watched it because there are some horrific scenes in here. There's blood in the movie that I think if came out today, it would get more of an R rating. But also just the, the visual of the vampires in this movie. This is, I think, probably the scariest vampire movie ever made and i was kicking myself and mad at myself that i did not watch this when it came out uh or you know at least throughout the years but to be honest up until youtube nobody had ever recommended this movie to me nobody had ever stopped me and said wait you've never seen salem's lot 
And I get that those kind of statements all the time now, you know, from you guys. That's kind of the beauty of YouTube and the movie world, you know, the online movie world, is that we check each other all the time. You haven't seen this movie? You haven't seen Dawn of the Dead? Are you kidding me? You haven't seen Night of the Living Dead? I have friends. Drewski McGillicuddy, he was checking me left and right on Night of the Living Dead. Uh, and, and other movies and uh, a lot of you guys do that and I think that's so cool because again and you might relate to this uh, I, I never had people growing up that would check me on horror movies and I really never had too many friends that were into horror like I was I felt like I was on an island once I jumped into YouTube and started talking movies and and meeting a lot of you people I was like oh shit there's a different world out there and there's people like me that love horror as much as I do and it's so cool I kind of love that this was a TV movie too, that it doesn't have the full screen 185 ratio or the 235 ratio. I kind of have a soft spot for TV movies from that era, you know, being the, the four by three ratio with the black bars on the sides. Um, I grew up in that uh, time frame, and, and I used to watch TV shows back then, like say Simon and Simon or Magnum PI, and especially, Dukes of Hazard and um, Incredible Hulk and, and all those, you know, we watched them on, you know, like Jolene back there, you know, a, a tube TV, right? And so it's kind of cool when you watch movies these days and I can say the Blu-ray of Salem's Lot looks gorgeous, looks phenomenal. If you can watch it on Blu-ray, on physical, definitely go that route over Max. Don't get me wrong, it still looks fine on Max, but... Man, you just don't get the extra detail like you do on the Blu-ray back there. Just gorgeous. Toby Hooper had done Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which just to timestamp this variety, just put out their top 10, uh, or actually top 50, I think, greatest horror films of all time. And Texas Chainsaw Massacre topped the list. I say bravo to that. I, I think that movie deserves that spot. You know, my all-time favorite movie is Halloween, but if you tell me that Texas Chainsaw Massacre is the number one horror movie of all time, I can't argue with you. E even Exorcist. Those two movies are so freaking important. And I'll even say this. I think Texas is more important than Halloween. It's, it's easily top two most important horror films of all time. It's hilarious when people say the remake's better. <laughs> I'm not going to... I've done a whole video on that, okay? Check it out. If I remember to, I'll put a card right here for that because that's just ridiculous. Maybe more enjoyable, okay? I'll give you that. But yeah, I guess to transition, I think part of the reason why I prefer the original Texas is because of the time frame that it came out. Uh, and I think Salem's Lot fits into that bill um, quite a bit. It has that old school vibe about it. Beautiful looking film, you know, looks like it was filmed in Panavision, 35 millimeter. Although I'm no expert at these things, I sound like I try to be sometimes, but because this was filmed in 4x3, they could still film this in Panavision, right? Let me know down in the comments, because I know some of you are experts on this, and uh, it just looks like it was filmed, you know, the film stop looks similar to, like, say, what you see in, like, Halloween. That's part of the reason I love this movie, is just the look of it. It looks glorious. There's something creepy, too, about the way this film breathes. It's never in a hurry, you know? It's a three hour movie and it takes its time and you don't even see that crate until like 30, 45 minutes in. You don't see Barlow entering the story. You don't see him at all, but you don't see him entering the story until quite a bit in the movie because they're trying to set up these great characters. David Soul, I think you could not cast a better guy to play Ben Mears. Um, I just like the look of actors, uh, you know, with the hair and everything back then. And I think that's what Rob Zombie is trying to um, imitate with some of his earlier movies, even though it looks more like the characters are wearing wigs. <laughs> Whereas David Soul, that was how he actually looked. Like William Forsythe in Rob Zombie's Halloween. It's clear that he's wearing a wig, you know? I, it just felt more natural, I guess, with, with Salem's Lot. Bonnie Bedelia looks irresistible beautiful but also i just think characters and people in general back then they were different than people now the the male figures back then were more they were tougher they were more stoic and david soul portrays that beautifully i don't know if you could play ben mears like david soul played him back then and uh, i think it's just so charming the way that character acts now james mason as straker that is a freaking hollywood legend 
His voice is one of the most identifiable voices to ever grace the silver screen. You know, he just had one of those voices, like, kind of like Jack Palance, you know? Not saying his voice was similar to Jack Palance, but certain character actors had a specific voice and you can even say like Michael Wincott, right? He has a voice like this, like two seconds after you hear it, you're like, oh, that's Michael Wincott. Same thing with James Mason. Straker, I think, is a, just a very interesting character because you don't know if he is a vampire. You don't know if he has any kind of special powers. He could be just a caretaker to Barlow. But, you know, by the end of the movie, we figure out that he does have some kind of supernatural strength. He could be a vampire. Bonnie Bedelia plays Susan remarkably. I think it's interesting that they tried to throw in the whole love triangle thing. They do touch on that in the remake, just barely. But in this movie, she sort of has a, a, a boyfriend. And that scene where the boyfriend, I guess he goes to take care of Ben Mears, and he just kind of pops up out of nowhere when, when uh, Ben Mears walks into the room. Definitely felt like a John Carpenter type of scene. That scene in the fog where the, the reverend just pops out of the corner. That was one of those like uh, an unnecessary scare. And I don't mean that in a bad way. You know, it's, it's just a very surprising scene. Like this shouldn't be a scare, but for some reason it's just really works because I jumped when he popped out of that corner. Do you envy me for watching this movie for the first time? Because anytime somebody tells me that they watched a classic that I saw back when I was a kid, like say Night of the Creeps. I saw Night of the Creeps when it first came on HBO. Uh, Once Bitten, you know, VHS is back there. I saw that when it first came on HBO. And anytime somebody tells me that they're watching like Night of the Creeps for the very first time, I'm jealous. I'm like, damn, I wish I could experience that again, you know? And I was wondering, because this is my first time watching Salem's Lot, do some of you that grew up with the movie envy me a little bit? Maybe you do. Let me know down in the comments. Now, let's talk about the vampires. And this kind of ties in with the patience that this movie has and how it doesn't get in a hurry to show the vampires. But when it does, boy, does it make it count. These are easily, and I stated this earlier, the most frightening vampires I have ever seen put to film today. Watching this today... What is this, 40, over 40 years later, 45 years later, they got me. And it takes a lot to get me these days. But, you know, the scene where the boy's floating in front of the window, the scene with uh, Jeffrey Lewis sitting in the chair. Uh, I think the one that got me the most might be Marjorie uh, Glick. When Marjorie Glick, uh, near the, the last act of the movie, she rises up on that table, and I just love how that scene's directed. You got the close-up of her hand hanging outside of the gurney. Toby Hooper, I think he's an economical director, but I think there's a lesson that he knew when he needed to get a little fancy with the scenes for the sake of the scares. The scene where Mike, the, uh, the grave digger, uh, he's like standing over the grave and it's shot in a very basic style. But then there's that one crane shot that kind of comes above him to his left side, looking down to kind of give it an ominous nature. And then you see from the point of view of the actual casket looking up. And I think when you don't go out of your way to make every shot, quote unquote, count and look scary and ominous, I think when you go more basic and you save those more strategic shots, for uh, the more scary scenes, I think it works better. And I think that's one reason why this movie is so effective. The scares kind of creep up on you. And they're not jump scares. I think there might be a couple of jump scares, but for the most part, the scares just kind of gradually present themselves. And I think learning something about myself, those are the scares that I appreciate more. Because I think that's when the director just has balls. You know what? I don't need to surprise you. I'm just going to come right at you slowly with an image in a way where the viewer has to sort of decipher what's coming at him. When the, when the image first presents itself, you might think one thing, but by the time it starts coming closer to you, then you start freaking out a little bit and you don't know how long the shot is going to linger. And then just the eyes of the vampires in, the, in this movie. I've stated in the past that one of my early scares that I remember was probably Thriller when Michael Jackson turns to the camera and he has these yellow eyes and boy did it freak me out I've had I've always had this thing with yellow eyes you know and I think everybody has their own one specific scare from their childhood that got them that's definitely one of the first for me and I think it's still very effective it still works to me 
Now, the last act is really interesting in Salem's Lot. Uh, you know, he had the big showdown at the Barlow Estate, which is cool. I really liked Mark as a character in this. And I found him interesting uh, as well because he was into, like, creatures. Kind of reminded me of... Tommy Jarvis in Friday the 13th Part 4, he had a similar interest. And I wonder if uh, J Joseph Zito might have been inspired a little bit by Salem's Lot because Mark was sort of that character. And that does come into play later in the movie when he talks about being able to get out of uh, any kind of knot, you know. I like when they plant little things in there that you know eventually, oh, that's going to come back. And that's what happens. But I did see, before seeing the movie, this, this iconic image of Bonnie Bedelia with the yellow eyes. And I was kind of waiting for that. Like, I knew that she was going to become a vampire. And everything plays out. You get the final act, and she's still not a vampire. You know, she just kind of disappears off screen. And then at the very end of the movie, and they're in Guatemala, and you have this team up between Mark and Ben. And then the last thing we see is Susan on the table. And she is a vampire. I think the reason they did that is because they were planning on doing a series out of this. There, there was going to be an, a complete TV season of Salem's Lot. And so maybe that's what they were trying to, to tee up. This is such a phenomenal film. Of course, I'm giving it a Trapped on an Island. I think it might be my all-time favorite vampire film, if I'm being honest. Even over, like, Lost Boys. It is that great. Over Fright Night. I never expected that when watching Salem's Lot. Quite the contrary. I honestly had no desire to watch the movie for so long, I doubted it. I thought it wouldn't be that great. I, but I never even knew that Toby Hooper directed it. But I think this might be Toby Hooper's like finest work uh, from a director's standpoint. You could see the uh, maturity in his craft from Texas Chainsaw Massacre to this. And I think he did another movie between the two. But... Um, it, it, this just feels like a seasoned filmmaker and he's doing a TV movie, funny enough. I definitely noticed a little bit of a, a Carpenter vibe throughout and maybe that was just how directors directed back then, you know? And maybe Carpenter took a little bit of that for himself, I don't know. What a phenomenal film, one that I will definitely watch every year. I had a great weekend of watching Nothing But Salem's Lot, which was really cool. And I think I'm getting more into like Stephen King and revisiting some of his past films. So uh, let me know what you guys think of the original Salem's Lot. I did see in the comments a lot of you that still haven't seen the original. And I almost beg you to watch it. It is that great. Also, be sure to come over to Killer Flicks where we talk horror all day and every day and on Fridays. What do you feel for Fridays? Follow me, Drum Dums, on my socials. Support me on Patreon. Buy me a coffee. And you guys, thank you so much for watching. Have a great day. Drum Dum out.